So welcome. Uh, my name's Andrew. Um, my uh, alter ego is Bank Builder. I like to believe I do that sort of thing from time to time. Um, and today we're going to be talking about um, my temporal journey. And everything that I'm doing and a whole lot more is on my GitHub repo, so you can get it there. Um, and uh, yeah, so if you miss anything, everything is there, all the example code, a whole, uh, a whole lot more information than what I can squeeze into this short time. Okay, so why do I call it a journey? Um, I'm not a, I'm not a developer, so I don't spend my day developing code or sitting inside the database. Um, and so for me, um, I had to go on. Uh, let's have a look here. For me, I had to s uh, go on a journey to help me understand what I wanted to achieve. So I'm going to move, I'm going to stand over here and say, well, this is a talk in two parts. What did I want to achieve? I was thinking about how we use databases in microservices and how do we manage this idea of history data um, in those microservices. And this is just one of many ways that this could be done. Um, but what I wanted to do was have a way of doing this that it wasn't the concern of the developer in the micro developing the microservice, it was part of the infrastructure or the environment. And so I thought, well, what we'll do is we'll create a database without concern for history in the microserve schema. We'll just apply some time zone uh, data uh, co columns to those tables, and then we'll use logical replication to replicate those tables through to a, a canonical um, database. And um, so you can have many of these, you'll have one of those, and then in here what we'll do is we'll enable, enable temporal date tables, we'll create a history table, we'll create, uh, um, uh, add a, f a procedure for the trigger, and then we'll replicate that data into the history tables. So that's what I set out to do. I didn't know how to do any of that. So then I had to come to this. This was my journey. Um, so the first part of my journey was just understanding time. This is a nice rabbit hole. So if you, <laughs> um, uh, and, I'll, and I'll give you some clues as to the rabbit hole. There's a lot more on the, on the, on the repo and you can just Google, you can spend hours, it's amazing. Um, but I needed to understand UTC. That's all I wanted to get to. So to get to that, I had to go through this journey to understand what is time zone data, a little bit about the ISO um, format for time, there's this idea of an epoch, etc., cetera, uh, time zones, all that sort of thing. So that was a nice uh, rabbit hole. But then to get to the database stuff, I needed to know, well, what SQL am I going to use to do those things? Um, and in order to do that, I needed to understand temporal tables. I needed to understand a little bit about range data. And I needed to understand a little bit about logical replication. And I'm going to take you through this journey as fast as I possibly can. Okay, so let's get going. Um, so the first part of the journey is the top half, and that part I'm going to rush through. The thing about time. Um, so time and our sense of time comes from essentially rotations the rota and, and cycles. Uh, the cycles of seasons, the rotations of the earth, um, the day-night cycle, etc. And the, the other thing about time is that as, uh, as time went by, we began to understand time in different ways. Um, and in one way of understanding time is that time is relative. Some of you might have seen that. That comes from Einstein's relativity. But the other thing about time, who's the person in the third row? The other thing about time is that time is subjective. So it's very, very interesting um, how we perceive and see time. Right, so I'm going to dash forward in my journey. Um, and two of the things uh, that became evident when one was looking at time is this idea of time zones. Um, and, and we're going to show a little bit more about time zones 
Um, and again, this is just the rabbit hole bit. We'll get to the sequel in a minute. This is the rabbit hole. It's so cool, this stuff. Um, the planet is divided into 15-degree um, segments. Those become our time zones. But it's not so simple, and you'll see in a minute why it's not so simple, because we throw in some convention for convenience, a little bit of politics, some old habits that come from the past, um, maybe a bit of daylight savings. Then there's the international dateline. And so time turns out to be a very complex thing. Um, on top of which, we now start measuring time, not just in uh, UTC, but in things like UTC1 and UTC2, where we use quasars and other external references to give us an accurate sense of time uh, here on Earth. And then, of course, that's time on Earth. Time elsewhere is a little bit different. So, for example, if we're on Venus, it rotates around the Sun in 224.65 Earth days and around its own axis in 116.75 Earth days. In other words, um, one Venus, uh, it takes how many? 1.92 Venus days for one Venus year. So that's another interesting thing about time, and you guys are going to go out and write interplanetary uh, databases, and if you think synchronizing your databases across time zones is complicated, wait until we start using uh, interplanetary networks and interplanetary file systems and interplanetary time servers. And it's not so far away if Elon gets his way. So let's just think about Earth. I said... Time zones are easy. We just take the planet. It's, it's almost a circle, sort of like a squashed circle, and we just divide it up, and we get time zones, except it's not so easy. Those are what our time zones look like today. Um, and you can see that um, there's some pragmatic issues. There's some geopolitical issues about how uh, time is managed. And even this here, so you've got, you got the UK over here, in UTC 0 or GMT, but GMT is now a time zone, not a, uh, uh, not a time standard. And they, anyway, they use British summer time in the summer, so they switch um, with daylight savings. So sometimes they use GMT or UTC and sometimes UTC plus 1. So um, those are time zones. Then we get this idea of an epoch. Um, and, and what I'm hoping is that when you see all of this stuff, you guys are going to want to go down the rabbit hole as well. Um, uh, Lisp set its time to start at 1900. Unix uses 1970. Um, and so does Postgres. The thing, the thing about uh, um, this is, is that um, the time, the various calendars, uh, some of them start at midnight and some of them start at midday. So, for example, we use Julian dates um, based on the Gregorian calendar, but it starts at midnight, but we start, uh, sorry, it starts at midday, but we use it in the computer world from midnight. So, if you ever work with time, it's going to make your mind spin. So the, civ the civil calendar used uh, by most countries is the Gregorian solar calendar. Um, it's introduced in 1582. It has 365.24.2425 days. And what was cool is it catered for leap years. So this, is, this was very close to what we have today, which is 365.2422 days. Um, and that's currently determined by our Earth's actual revolution around the sun. Here's the catch. We're slowing down. So, <laughs> so every... Every year there's, there's, there's this thing called leap seconds and so on. So the time is busy changing all the time. Next time you underappreciate your NTP server, think about this. Okay, this is, uh, and your database just does this for you. It's like auto magic. It's like awesome. Now, understanding leap years, it's like having a conversation with your spouse. If you think you can win this conversation, let's see. Every year that is exactly divisible by four is a leap year, except for years that are exactly divisible by 100, which are not, except for when these centennial years are exactly divisible by 400. Then they are. Uh, and to think that this was done in the late 1500s, that this logic was, was arrived at, it's actually pretty awesome. 
right we can okay we, we're going to move uh, on to some code that you hopefully will never have to use again because your database does this for you and your programming languages do this for you but just to point out I didn't realize that in the US of A uh, the weekday starts on Sunday and the ISO day of the week starts on Monday so that could be a snafu for you if you weren't uh, paying attention okay so we tend to prefer words to numbers it's easier to have um, concepts in words rather than numbers and so we then translate all of this into months days of week um, times of day etc and then of course that creates its own chaos and you've all seen this like how in the year 2018 can we not get our systems to know where we are so that it does day day month month instead of month month day day okay I don't have to say more but if you really feel strongly about it and you're on Linux you can set the time style okay so we end up with this language neutral notation 8601 ISO 8601 and it solves the problem by just adding verbosity makes it long but you have an unambiguous date uh, a T to indicate that time follows time with seconds and fractions of a second and then the UTC time zone just a word about the international date line just you, like you think you've got this under control and then you discover there's this international date line Do, are you aware that every day on this planet we're in three dates somewhere on the planet eh? three or four three uh, and there's an example so you could be on the 2nd of May in, in, in London you can be in the 1st of May in America Samoa and you can be on the 3rd of May in Kirimu Kirimati in the Pacific Ocean and if you want to be the first to celebrate New Year that's where you need to be in addition there are other conventions for time one of them is Zulu time those of you who have done radio ham or flying or seen what the military do they use Zulu time it's an equivalent notation for um, for UTC um, and it just was interesting that we have um, uh, we actually have a place on the planet called Zulu and if you're interested uh, you can go and check out their time zone okay what I'd like to do now what I'd like to do now so that time doesn't get away with us is dive into the into the Postgres into the into the examples so what we've done is we've gone through the journey in the top and just to remind you what I'm trying to achieve is I'm, I'm trying to achieve this idea that you could have microservices that have their own database. You have a canonical database that's eventually consistent. So it eventually looks like the microservice database, a few milliseconds or whatever later. And we use logical replication. Um, so the DML, so when you do an insert or a, a select or whatever at the top, that stuff is replicated down to the bottom. Um, and um, the concerns of managing history data, temporal data, data that changes in time, is not a concern of the microservice, but a concern of the canon. That's the problem statement. Um, that may not be the best way to solve all these kinds of problems. It's just what I set out to do. Okay. And what we're going to do is I would like to just switch to my GitHub repo quickly. Um, and while that's switching they said check the network beforehand which I did while that's switching I'm going to just open up a terminal big enough okay <coughs> so um, 
for the next three or four minutes, I'm going to go through slowly and just build up the ideas. Then I've got a set of scripts, which is going to run through it fairly quickly because we've got very little time to go through it. Um, so um, what I want to do is, um, uh, I must just make sure I'm in the right, in the right place. Um, I want to just um, clone this repo. Um, and in this repo is, an, is a reworking of the plugin PG Temporal Tables as a pure SQL script, um, which I thought was nice and elegant because it works nicely in Docker containers. I don't have to worry about um, the plugins. I'm actually going to go to the plugin session later so I can understand how that might be a better way. Um, and what I'm going to do is, uh, let's just go there. Um, and because I don't have um, Postgres installed on my local machine, I'm just going to use a Docker container to do that. And I should have it installed already, so it should work. Okay. Oh, that's not good. Oh, uh, yes. So one of the things about um, demos and the demo gods is uh, one should always... <laughs> Uh, one, one, one should always cut and paste. So that's the first, the first rule. Okay, that looks more successful. Um, and Murphy's Law is that there's been a change since I did this last night. So we'll just give this a second. I apologize for this. So in order to make this work, what I do have is I have the psql tools installed locally, but I don't have a server installed. So you'll see I'll use the Postgres, um, the psql command, um, but I'll always be connecting to a Docker container which is running, which is running the server. And it's a convenient way for developing because you can develop with different versions. And typically, um, uh, you should tag the Postgres version. Otherwise, bad things happen during the demos. Okay, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to run this on um, port 544. Okay, and um, I'm going to create myself a database. Let me just clear that. I'm going to create myself a database called Temporal Test. And I'm going to import the function that we cloned. Um, into that database. And just so that you can get an idea of what that function looks like, um, we can just have a look. Um, and the things that we're interested in are going to be this, the first two columns there, sys period, and the history table. So those things we're going to see again and again. If you want to go through the SQL code, it's all available, and you're welcome to have a look at it. Okay, so we have our database, and I'm going to log into this database. And I need to get going before we run out of time. And I'm just going to create a table. This is a table that many of you have seen and wish you hadn't. Okay. <laughs> um, we've all had to deal with KYC or FICA. Um, very, very simplistic. I'm not worried about the table structure or anything. I just need a place to put data so I can show you how... Um, how this temporal um, data works. Okay, and what I'm going to do now is, and I did it as two commands because I actually would like you to look at it, is I'm going to alter this table and I'm going to add a column called sys period. It is of type timestamp time zone range. And the default is a, a range starting from the current timestamp and not ending. So it's current. Okay. And then because we're looking at how we create temporal data, I'm going to create a history table that looks exactly the same. So I'm just making a replica of it. Okay, and to be sure that, we, that what you see is what you get, there's the first table. And um, 
I hate that thing. And let's do this. There's the second table. Okay. And so that you know that the function is in the database, which you saw us add in. There it is. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to bind these two things together by creating a trigger on the Fika status to the Fika history table. Okay. And um, so it's not really very complicated. The magic is in the, um, in the, in the function. So I'm going to create a trigger called versioning trigger. It's going to trigger on update and delete. Um, and it's going to call that function that we added versioning with the system period we added, this column that we've added here, um, and the table, the history table that is, it's associated with. And there we have it. Okay. And if we want to see those triggers, there's a nice little query that does that for us. Um, let me just take you back there. Okay, and you can see that our um, our event for delete and update is in the database. Now we're ready to give this a test drive. And you can see here I have some test data. I've got Mr. Big, non-compliant, and he was added by Vanessa. I've got Mr. Cool, who is frozen, added by Tracy, and Mr. Frugal, who is compliant, added by Betty. Okay, and I just realized now that all three of these are women. That was subconscious. Um, I, had, I had real people in the back of my mind when I was doing this. So um, each of these maps to an actual person who deals with FICA data in my environment. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to make changes to this data. And I'm making changes in the FICA status table. Remember, we've got this trigger now, and the changes that are affected will cause um, information to move into the FICA history table. So let's, let's update a row. Um, let's do another update. Whoops. No. Come on, demo gods. Right. And let's delete a row. Now, deleting is a little bit more complex, but we'll have a look at it in a minute. Okay, so what I've done is I've changed... Um, Mr. Big status to compliant from non-compliant. I've changed Mr. Cool status from frozen to expired, and we just got rid of Mr. Frugal. Who needs Frugal anyway? Um, and let's have a look at what happened. So we can bounce back here, and we should be able to see. We should be able to see what happened. So there's our changes. We expected that. Notice what this period looks like. It is range data. It starts at the date that um, the record was first entered doesn't have an ending date because it's still valid for the system that row okay and now let's do the same for the history table and in the history table perhaps i can make this just a wee bit smaller okay no not really um, for the history table you'll see there are the changes that we made to the FICA status table are now sitting in the history table. And now you see that the range data of system period, in other words, when these were valid in the system, show when they were added. And then the second value in the range data shows until it was valid, because that's when it, the row changed. And so you get um, the system validity, if you like. Um, and um, and we're going we're gonna to speed up now. Um, just, a, just an interesting thing is, I know that it's evil for me to mention this, but Microsoft SQL Server has a similar thing. Um, and I have no idea how Microsoft SQL works. Um, I barely know how Postgres works. Um, but it was interesting for me to see that other, um, uh, other, other databases have the same way or similar way of dealing with this. Right, and then the last thing that we need to do in this part of, uh, this part of the demo is um, how do I find out what I've deleted? Because it's not in my FICA status table. You just do a left join, and you can find out what's missing. And we see that we deleted Mr. Frugal. OK. So uh, to summarize, 
because now we're going to do it with scripts and it's going to go a whole lot faster. But to summarize, we had a table. We created another table like it. We set up uh, triggers on uh, update and delete. We then um, we used the versioning function, which is a, a SQL implementation of um, PG temporal tables. Um, when, you when you insert into here, nothing happens in the history table. But when you update or delete and you change this data, then that gets copied into the history table. Now we're going to extend this picture to the replication where we take the history table and we move it down into the canonical database and it's no longer in the same database. We're first going to replicate and then on the replicated data we're going to manage our temporal information. How are we doing for time? Right. <coughs> okay. So what I've what I've got in the repo, I've already cloned the repo, so I'm not going to try to do it again. Um, what I've got in the repo is a Docker Compose, and in that Docker Compose, I'm just going to show you quickly. Uh, in that Docker Compose, we have a couple of um, images. We've got an image for um, our Fika data. I just created another one to represent a different microservice. In this case, I've got one for Jibar data, Johannesburg interbank rate data. And I've got another one for my canonical database. So I've got three servers running with that we're going to access now on three ports. Um, and I've created a network between them. And the reason I've done that is so that when they see each other, they see each other on port 5432. But when I look at them from my host machine, I'm seeing them on the mapped port that the Docker is exposing. Okay, I hope that makes sense. It took me a while to get that right because every single example that you get goes maps 5432 to 5432 and you're not sure whether you're inside or outside of yourself. Um, okay, and nice and easy. We just get this up and running. Docker compose up and I'm just going to do a detach because I want this terminal. And there we go. We spin up the network. We spin up the containers. And we have um, our various um, uh, um, containers, our various servers running in those containers now. What I've, what I've done is, in this repo, I've created uh, steps one through six, and we're going to run through those steps. OK, so um, let's just have a look at what they are. Okay, in step one, we're basically just going to connect to those servers, create our databases, and populate them with some data. So I've got a script to populate Fika data. You've seen that Fika data, Jibar data. I just took a month of Jibar data and throwing, throwing it in the table. We'll look at it later. Notice that we're only adding the versioning function to the canonical database because that's the only place where we're going to worry about the temporal data. Um, and a script to just set up the canonical database. Uh, this is the DDL. So logical replication does not replicate DDL. It only replicates DML. OK, so let's, let's give that a, sh a shot. And we'll just run that. I feel like the one-fingered typist here. OK, done. Now, what, what I'd like us to do is just have a look at the next thing that we're going to do. Here we're just going to go and have a look at what's in our, in our Fika server, what's in our Jibar server, and what's going on on the canonical um, on the canonical database. So this is just a look-see. And let's just scroll up and have a look-see. <coughs> Excuse me. There, that's the data we knew. Okay, we've seen that data. Um, and that's sitting in our Fika server. In our Jibar server, we've just added some Jibar data. And I, just, I basically just copied this straight off the JSC website. There's a feed you can get it. Um, and it looks exactly the same. I just took the columns that I got exactly from the JSC and I added this thing, this period for now. We're going we're gonna to work with this data a little bit later. Um, those are my tables that I've got in my canonical database. So because logical replication, which we're going to Im implement shortly, doesn't, allow, doesn't replicate DDL. I have to apply the same DDL on the canonical database as I do in each of the microservices so that when I replicate, it finds the structure that it's looking for over there. 
And here you can see that for each of the tables that I intend to uh, manage the history data, I've set up um, the triggers. Okay, 10 minutes, let's get going. Um, so, let's have a look what the next step is. Okay. If I don't finish the whole talk, it doesn't matter. This part is quite important, so we'll slow down just for a minute here. And that is, um, what we're going to do is we're going to change the server, which by default is not set up for logical repl replication. And, we, and in order to do that, we need to restart the server, which is a bit of a bummer if it's inside a container. So that's what these uh, hack uh, sleeps are. It's to allow the container to restart after I've changed the config. Um, and believe me, if you don't have it, you can't get it to work. Otherwise, you have to build your own containers. You can't use off-the-shelf stuff. Um, so let's do that. So basically, I'm just changing the configuration of, um, of the database servers and setting up logical replication. Okay, now... Now what we're going to do, and let's just come here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to set up the publish and subscribe for the replication. So the way that the logical le replication works is, is you have a publisher and a subscriber. The publisher just says, I'm going to publish this table. And I'm doing it, you can do it on a schema level, I think, but I'm doing it at a table level. I'm just publishing this table. So all events, all DML events that occur on this table will be published. Okay. Then you have a subscriber that would then connect to that server and subscribe to those events and apply those events locally in the server. And that's, that's, that's the concept as far as I understand it. In order to make it work, I'm going to need a user. So I've created a logical user, super secure password, and they need permissions. So we're going to grant them permissions, and then we create the publication. And we do the same down here. So for the Fika server, we're going to public. Uh, we're going to uh, create a publication for the table Fika status, and in the Jibar server, we're going to create a publication for the table Jibar, and then on the canonical database, we're going to subscribe to those respective um, uh, publications, and the subscription takes a connection string. So within my Docker network, I can identify the the, the IP address or the host just by calling the docker the container name um, and you'll notice that here I'm using 5432 and that's because I'm inside the inside the it's from container to container so let's give this a go um, and this will set up that was a bit of a anticlimax eh? um, right now I think all we're going to do here is take a look so what we're going to do is we're just going to um, have a look <coughs> at what we've got here, what we've got here, and then we're going to, um, what's this? And for interest sake, we'll take a look at how Jibar is different in each database. So what the Jibar table looks like in, um, in, the, in the microservice database and what it looks like in the canonical database. So let's go and have a, let's run that. So we're just taking a quick peek before we make our changes. Right, so let's have a look. So our FICA status um, has, um, has replicated. Uh, there's no FICA history because nothing's changed in the publishing um, database. Um, and let's have a look here. Um, we've done an update. Then we went and did an update um, to Mr. Big. And what we find then is that the data is replicated over to the FICA uh, status history table and we've got Mr. Big is now changed to, it was non-compliant, let's go. Okay, I'm filled with confidence, we'll have a look in a second. Um, this is the Jibar data. Uh, okay, so what's happened here is, is a versioning problem um, <laughs> between the container version and the um, uh, and the um, and the version of SQL that I'm running on my machine. What I what I want I'm not going to even try and fix it now. 
What, I, what I'm going to do though is I'm just going to pause at that point and I think let's just log on to this uh, canonical database. Oh, hang on, let's just run the last script. And this last script is going to allow us to make some more changes. So in this script what we did was we got rid of all the null, um, all the null rows um, and I just changed who did it. And that's in the Jibar database and you'll see that it's replicated down now to the Jibar history, all the rows that were changed. Um, um, from Jibar history, what was updated and what was changed. Temporal data and what I've done here is just single temporal data. So we've got some data. When we make changes, we keep track of it. Single series of data, cis period. But you do get this idea of bitemporal data. This is where you have two lots of temporal data changing simultaneously. And where this is important is where you have uh, a validity period. In other words, when some data is valid, which is distinct from when I knew about it in the system. So let me say that again. Bitemporal data typically refers to when I have data for which it's valid. Another example would be int interest rates. The interest rate is valid from this day to this day, but I only knew about it on this day for this period before it was changed. So you get the system validity when it was valid in the system and when it was valid in its own right. So I call it sys period and validity. And what I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is, um, let me just see what I call those things, um, bitemporal, there we go. Um, what I'd like to do is just have a look, not bot, bitemporal. Um, okay, so what I've done here is I've just taken everything that we've done and we're going to create a database. We're going to put Jibar data into it. We're going to clean it up. And we are going to turn that single dimension Jibar data into bitemporal data. That's what, this, that's what the script does. And then the second script does some operations on that, uh, on that data. So let's go ahead and execute that. Um, And hopefully, this uses a pinned container, so it doesn't have that problem with the versioning number. Oh no! But I, but it is. It's pulling version ten, which is good. Um, and we give it a few seconds to start. There, there are some nifty scripts out there that will wait and look for your container to see that it's the server is service has started before it tries to connect. Uh, the poor man's way is just to wait before you push enter. Okay. Um, so what we've done here is I've added in the data and I've removed all the rows where it was zero. Now a row from the JSC, when they give you a zero, it basically means that the rate hasn't changed. So from the first to the fourth, they don't give you rate information and they just assume that the rate is the same from the first to the fourth. It happens to be the same on the fourth as well, but you can't assume that. Okay. Um, and what we're going to do is turn this data into bitemporal data. Okay. And now we're going to convert this to bitemporal data. So a few things that we're going to do. We use the gist index, um, which is uh, when you go and look at the, at the repo, you'll, you'll see. Um, and we create a valid from range. So I'm, this, is, this is an aggregate. I'm just showing what it would look like. So now I'm creating a range. And this date uh, range that I've created. Sorry, Mr. Andrew. Yes. Time is up. Oh, okay. So we're going to end. I'm going to just push enter because you've got to see the end. Uh, <laughs> um, and there you have it. There is your bitemporal data. Um, and we've converted something that just was a set of rows into something that has a validity and a system validity. Any questions? It's definitely the marathon room, this. Yes? Regarding whether, your time wa regarding whether your time was up, I would give you the benefit of the doubt because you were the guy talking about time. time. <laughs> All time is relative, yes. Um, so everything is on the GitHub repo. Um, and in fact, last night I got a pull request. 
um, from Melanie, uh, no, Melissa. And what she's done is she's taken this, she's actually created JavaScript microservices, I mean Java, Java microservices, and implemented this so that you can do this through an API calls and see exactly the same thing occurring. Okay. So if you want to see how it's actually implemented with microservices, I haven't accepted the pull request because I was too afraid to do it last night. I'll, I'll do it today. Okay. So it should be in the repo today. <laughs> okay, so there's some good stuff.